I welcome you all. And uh, to begin with, uh, I'll hand over to Neerat Patnagar, the founder of Belong, to you know um, um, introduce the concept behind the festival to the audiences as well. So, hi, Neerat. Uh, thanks, Arunj. And uh, morning, and welcome everyone to uh, to day one of the Inclusive Schools Festival. Uh, can can you hear me all right? Is my audio coming through fairly clearly? Yes. Okay. Uh, so a, it's really exciting to have uh, to, to put this together and have all of you attend. Uh, I want to begin by maybe providing a little bit of context uh, and just thanking everyone involved so far, and then I'll pass it back to uh, Saranj for uh, for a super exciting first session. Uh, so so a, a little bit about belong before we describe the schools festival, this inclusive schools festival. So belongs a social venture uh, that was set up about a year year and a half ago to really bring uh, discrimination-free experiences and services to people who would otherwise face uh, prejudice and bias because of their identity, because of their gender, their race, their caste, their disability, their sexual orientation, and, and other such markers. Uh, our work over time has converged into three different spaces. The first space is uh, inclusive literature, where we sort of convene a lot of dialogues and conversations. We have a network of libraries across the country uh, that uh, post books of the sort. Uh, we have uh, regular weekly sort of discussions and very soon you'll see an app and, and also a podcast that we launch. Uh, the second is really inclusive research where we curated a lot of uh, uh, academic research um, that's peer reviewed on, on these topics. And, and uh, we also launched a web platform that brings these uh, research papers, these data sets together. And also you see uh, a lot of activity uh, around that. We have similar conferences and conversations uh, around those topics. And, and last, but perhaps most importantly, the third focus area for us has been inclusion in schools, uh, both K-12 schools and also universities and colleges. Uh, uh, there are two programs that are running uh, right now, one which focuses on uh, inclusion in K-12 schools. Uh, and we're really using uh, the, uh, the, the whole uh, sort of uh, the theory of change is if you actually uh, create peer allies and if you create inclusive counselors, then you can actually get a lot of um, uh, momentum uh, for these topics in, in schools across the country. So, so the, that's called the inclusive uh, uh, ambassador program, school ambassador program. That's sort of uh, something that's running in ten schools across the country. Uh, and then second is uh, a program that we'll soon launch uh, across uh, all the Indian institutes of management to try and create inclusion clubs uh, at the Indian Institute of Management uh, to again uh, bring support services to students who otherwise uh, face bias because of who they are. Uh, and then uh, while these two are programs, we felt it was really really important to. Uh, actually convene dialogue and conversations on these topics. Uh, there's a lot of really incredible work that's happening uh, across the country uh, and also globally uh, on these themes. And, and we felt it would be really important to showcase uh, some really, really uh, fascinating work that's happening and also some uh, very difficult questions that people are navigating, that organizations are navigating uh, as they think about inclusion. Uh, the sad truth is that hundreds of millions of students across the country uh, still uh, face a fair bit of uh, prejudice and bias because of who they are, their, their disability, their uh, queerness, their um, faith, their uh, caste, and so on and so forth. And it's really important that we sort of uh, start talk talking about this uh, in a meaningfully structured way. And that's what led uh, to this festival being put together in partnership with The Wire. Uh, so uh, the hope was that we'll actually uh, explore some really important questions over the next two days uh, about what does inclusion in schools really mean? Uh, what does it mean in terms of, let's say, pedagogy? What does it mean in terms of curriculum design? Uh, what does it mean in terms of classrooms? Uh, and each of these, and then obviously, uh, in addition to these conversations, we are also sort of curating some, uh, uh, some filmmaking, some sort of cultural uh, experiences, which actually have children at the center uh, of those. Uh, so, and, and each of these uh, panels and conversations that we actually have over the next uh, two days uh, brings together uh, a few, uh, I'd say, uh, leaders uh, in the space. Uh, some of them are uh, people who lead this at school. Some of them are actually uh, uh, head of, uh, heads of foundations who've been working on these topics. Uh, some of them are researchers, academics uh, who've uh, thought about this. Uh, some of our innovators who've actually uh, brought to life some really, really important uh, elements of, of inclusion in schools. Uh, and, and we're treating this almost as uh, a, a learning journey for ourselves, but also uh, with the hope that this actually leads to a lasting community of people within India who then 
uh, stay in touch and, and sort of keep on adding to the uh, adding to the dialogue. Uh, a lot of the, what gets discussed uh, will sort of uh, a find its way into media. So we, we sort of harvest uh, some of the more important ideas from uh, from these two days and then put that out there uh, as op eds or, or as as even uh, edited video pieces. But but uh, also we allow everyone who's a part of the festival to actually stay in touch with each other. Uh, there'll be some sort of uh, communication around that and and uh, really for us this is the start of a journey uh, and uh, we're really really excited to a learn from all of you uh, also understand what what the really big problems are and uh, uh, what we can try and do together uh, i will pass it to saraj in just about a minute but again i just want to thank you uh, a for attending uh, to all the panelists for session one for really uh, making time for this and then uh, uh, pitching in with your thinking uh, and the uncomfortable sort of truths that uh, sit at the heart of some of these questions, uh, and also some hopeful sort of solutions uh, that uh, that uh, point the way, uh, and also the belong team who's really worked hard to put this together. So uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I hope this is fun for you and, and enjoyable for you, uh, and also something you take away, uh, some ideas you take away with you. Uh, uh, thank you again. Uh, over to you, uh, Saranj. Yeah. Thank you, Neeraj. Um, so. Um... We thank Access for as well, uh, who have lent their, uh, you know, uh, sign language interpreters for this particular panel, which is about to begin. Uh, just to begin with, uh, Access for All aims at pushing the boundaries of physical, intellectual, and social access through innovative indigenous, indigenous design and advocacy while fostering an inclusive experiential culture. The team focuses on access audits, interpretation and educational activities, inclusive outreach programs, sensitization and awareness program, braille tactile kits, braille books, and CSR based engagement programs. So I am also pasting um, uh, their website in the chat box in case if you wish to connect with them. Um, and uh, now we will begin with Introducing the moderator for the next panel, um, uh, Deong Lee is moderating this particular um, upcoming panel, which is what is an inclusive school? Uh, Deong co-leads Dahlberg's education and employment practice area and is the Mumbai office director. Dahlberg Advisors is a strategy consulting firm focused on social impact. Deong has worked with a wide range of education actors, including non-profits, school districts, and state education systems, foundations, corporates, and private equity firms. She is currently supporting four of India's leading education NGOs in serving over 100,000 students across teacher training, leadership, development, ed tech, and remedial education interventions. She helped them pivot to remote learning during the pandemic. She has recently conducted a large scale study of the impacts of COVID-19 on students learning with UNICEF with a focus on vulnerable segments of children. She has supported some of India's largest life skills organization in developing their strategies and has worked with the government of Andhra Pradesh to pilot edtech and prepare for scale up. She conducted strategies strategic reviews of a large scale career and life development program in Hong Kong and has helped develop the evaluation framework for a girls leadership academy in India. Prior to Dalberg, Deong was a management consultant with the Panthenon group, now EY Parthenon in San Francisco and Mumbai. Uh, me and my team would be uh, pasting the introductions in the chat box uh, it would, uh, I think, be helpful um, for people who might have missed the audio uh, introductions. So um, I'll hand over it to uh, Deong, and we would begin by uh, 11 sharp. For the users of uh, sign language, uh, it is suggested that you follow Access for All, SLI 1 and uh, access for all SLI2 who would be translating throughout the panel. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, I'm really excited to be moderating this opening panel on what is an inclusive school. Um, we have some fantastic panels later today and tomorrow that is going to uh, explore different elements of this question in depth, diving into specific uh, dimensions such as classroom pedagogy and practices, as well as uh, curriculum. But in this opening panel, we want to really set the stage for what inclusion and exclusion looks like in schools in different ways for different stakeholders. Inclusive education, I think, often gets too narrowly uh, conceived as inclusive of children with special education needs. But I'm really happy um, that this discussion will broaden the scope of what inclusion means as it applies to students and people with diverse identities and backgrounds. So I think that'll make uh, this whole discussion really special. And we want to not only conceptually understand what this means, but use these generous, I think, two hours that the Belong team have created for us to really unpack what inclusion and exclusion in our schools feel like um, to our parents, students, and educators. And we will explore some of the barriers and enablers for our schools to become more inclusive and what are some concrete ways that schools and school systems can become more inclusive. So this morning we have a tremendous group of panelists joining us, bringing different perspectives from lots of different uh, walks of life. And I'll provide a very brief introduction and then turn it over actually to each of our panelists so they can share more about their work directly. We have Bertha joining, uh, who is an educator best known as the inventor of the Braille code in Kasi language. She's the headmistress of the Jyoti Surat School in Shillong, a school run by the Bethany Society for the Visually Impaired Children, who are uh, now serving many others as well. We have Dr. Nilakshi Roy, who is an educator by background, who has also founded Culture All with her students, which run several culture, uh, cultural awareness programs to promote inclusion and diversity. She's also an active member and one of the spokespersons of this WECAR Rainbow Parents Group, where she works to promote acceptance of the members of the LGBTQIA community. Uh, we also have joining with us Sonali, who is an expert on special education and the president of Souls Arc. She's worked extensively on curriculum and pedagogy development for children with special needs for more than 20 years and has grown Souls Arc to become one of uh, India's largest organizations that focus on special education. Not last uh, but not least is Sucheta, who is the CEO of Dream a Dream, one of India's largest and most influential NGOs that empower children from vulnerable backgrounds to overcome adversity and thrive in this fast changing world. So we're really excited to hear from uh, each of our panelists. But, but before we go there, I thought we can quickly take an audience poll. Um, some of these webinars tend to be a one-way street, almost like watching television these days. And I think it's always interesting uh, also for our panelists to get a sense of who's actually uh, in the audience today. So Saranj, if you don't mind, can we launch the audience poll? Yes. Excellent. So we just have two simple questions to get to know you better. So I have launched the poll and uh, let me know when to close it. Great, thank you. So the first question is, which of the following roles best describes you? Feel free to select multiple. Are you a student, parent, educator, school counselor, uh, someone in the education sector, development sector, uh, representative of the government, others? The second question is on a scale of one to five, where one is not at all, and five is fully inclusive. How inclusive were the schools you attended growing up? If you were to reflect on your experience. And if you're a student today, how inclusive do you think your school is? So Saranja, yes, yeah. In case the have uh, any doubt, uh, they can obviously uh, you use Q&A box 
to uh, you know uh, register their doubts, questions, comments. Sure, sounds great. And the format of the next two hours or so will be a moderated, um, structured sort of discussion, followed by an audience Q&A, followed by some closing reflections from our panelists. It's exciting poll results. Um, we have slightly under half, I guess, of our um, participants or our audience today as educators. Um, really great to see also other education sector workers and a quarter, um, which is I think super exciting of our audience being students themselves. 10% parents, 20% uh, development sector workers. We also have three uh, government members in the audience, which is I think very exciting. And some school counselors as well. So quite a diverse range of uh, stakeholders from the education system. Welcome everyone. And to our second question on how inclusive were the schools you attended growing up or your schools are today? Unfortunately, only one person answered uh, fully inclusive. That's quite sad. Um, and hope that this discussion um, helps provide really concrete tips for educators and uh, the sector to ensure that, you know, five years from now, when we take this poll again, many more move to that fully inclusive category. Um, but about a third said neutral and um, almost more than half, it seems like, uh, believe that their schools were not at all inclusive or, or um, not inclusive. So clearly a big challenge um, and we're very excited to hear from all of our panelists today on you know, why the challenge exists and how we can start to tackle it. Um, so I think as we begin, I want to actually turn it over to each of our panelists. Maybe we'll just go alphabetical order, starting with Bertha. Um, to share a little more about their work, but perhaps more importantly, what got them started? What was the motivation behind focusing really on promoting inclusion and in education in this country? Bertha, do you want to kick us off? Thank you. Good morning. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I had been introduced um, as headmistress of the Jyoti Road School, which is a unit of Bethany Society in Shillong. Uh, I've ceased to be the headmistress now since 2013. And currently I'm working as a senior program coordinator in the organization Bethany Society, mainly looking after education. Um, in addition to all the work that I've been doing along with Bethany Society and the team here in disability in special education, we have now moved on into inclusive education. The idea of inclusive education hit me in the 2002-2003, where as a person working with uh, children with visual impairment and in a special residential school, I felt that it was too claustrophobic for our children. And what they really learned was academics. So in 2006, uh, as an organization, we moved into reverse integration where all children, um, uh, now come and study in the Jyotis Road School. We, the work that we've done in Bethany Society has created a bit of a stir, especially among our um, funders, the CBM, the Light for the World, Liliana Fons, and they thought that it would be a good idea to promote quality inclusive education in the northeastern region of India. So in 2016, uh, 
the race that means the regional action for inclusive education northeast india project was launched and it ended uh, officially um, a few months back um, i had been heading the uh, project where we work with 15 partner organizations spread over the states of manipur nagaland tripura assam and meghalaya and where these 15 organizations had taken up about five to 10 government SSA schools uh, to work with them in order to promote inclusive education. Of course, this was done in agreement and with appreciation from the state governments. So um, that is where we stand and that is where our passion is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bertha. And apologies for uh, misquoting your current role, but really glad to hear that you're still very much involved. Um, so passing it on to Dr. Nilakshi Roy now. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Nilakshi and my pronouns are she and her. Um, at the outset, I must congratulate uh, Belong for uh, getting together such a wonderful lineup of programs for two days and such illustrious uh, you know, colleagues and fellow panelists as Bertha, who is a Padma Shri. So I uh, really feel humbled to be in your uh, company, Bertha. I've never really worked with uh, uh, Padma Shri even remotely uh, in any capacity. So a uh, lot of love and a lot of good wishes to you and the children that you work with, um, rather than making it very formal. Yeah, um, to my other colleagues here in the panel also, warm welcome. I represent Swika Rainbow Parents. We are only a support group and we are pretty uh, new, uh, but we help parents accept and understand their children of uh, diverse sex sexual orientation and identity. We work largely on telephone and on uh, WhatsApp, keeping everyone's identity uh, you know, confidential. Uh, so it is a confidentiality which uh, you know initially supports and helps many parents who are still not out. So that's the way we function. We function through Facebook and through WhatsApp, as I said. So and on Instagram. So you will find us uh, present on Facebook and uh, Instagram as Swika Rainbow Parents. In case anyone wants to join us, you will find a, a link in the bio which will help you to fill up a Google form if you want to be parent members only. I mean, that's all that's allowed here in our organization. My personal journey with social ex exclusion and discrimination started very early in life uh, with my sister, who was very weak in maths and science, and she was bullied in school for that. I mean, in Bengal, such things do happen. You know, you can be bullied just because you are, you know, weak in academics, okay? Uh, in, in a class full of peers who are very, very gung-ho about their, their science and uh, maths prowess. So the same thing was repeated with my younger daughter, Koninika, uh, in Mumbai, who was, um, to add to, the, to her misery, also getting obese as she became an adolescent. So she was very gentle, but she became very withdrawn and reclusive. She turned very quiet as she was growing up, and that distance between her and myself and her family started growing. It was better in college, definitely. And she flowered there. She became a college topper. She became a university rank holder. She participated in many programs, etc. But after this, new dimensions emerged as she discovered her sexual orientation as a lesbian first. And then subsequently, she came out to herself as bisexual, especially when she was away from home, abroad, studying at the university. So you can imagine the kind of uh, you know, loneliness that she and I sense of isolation that she must have felt. Somehow this journey of myself has been centered around her school and college and her uni experiences. And me being a teacher, definitely, uh, you know, I think I want safer and more inclusive spaces in academic institutions with capable counselors and mentors helping students in crisis. Svikar as a group works to raise awareness among people in all spaces all spaces, I say, not only in schools. So we don't work exclusively with schools. We work with corporates very, very largely, and we work with other NGOs also. Um, so, uh, but we, we have been addressing many academic institutions in the past, uh, colleges of diverse uh, background, 
parent teacher associations, uh, school organizations, teachers, uh, counselors, and others in, in similar spaces. Um, uh, I myself am most interested in spreading this idea, um, the idea that it's, it's very important to have official formulations regarding diversity, as I think all of us here agree. Since uh, I, I also believe that since there is at present no detailed official documentation available, not as yet, you know, unlike say the NASP in the US, etc., or multiple documents every state in the US has for, you know, for um, uh, transgender and other uh, inclusivity principles. Uh, I think it is time that more organizations like ours here and, you know, all our several partners um, all over the, uh, you know, NGO and community space, that so people like us and individuals fine tune what is already available, maybe the NEP to start with, and anything else that is possible to formalize, to legalize, to enshrine in black and white and gold, if you like, because you know that's what only boards and schools understand. Uh, subsequently, I will talk more about that, but you know, to, right now I feel that the sky is the limit for us to be inclusive. There is There are no stops as yet, so let us try. This is probably, you know, one good shot that we can give together to make these spaces in schools and colleges more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nilakshi. That's really inspiring. Um, and over to you, Sonali. What got you started in this journey? Um, so I have kind of two milestones that uh, one is what got me started and the second is um, what made us shift the model to where we are today. Uh, so as a part of, um, you know, my, my background, special education and psychology, and that kind of professionally led me to uh, this, this starting uh, Solzak uh, at a very early stage. So 2003 is when we started. Uh, when we started, so about for 10 years, uh, we kind of worked directly with uh, individuals with the autism, intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, and with mental health challenges. And that journey uh, continued for 10 years where we evolved a lot of standardization, a lot of uh, you know, sectorial uh, gaps that we saw where roadmaps were not clear, standardization was not there, curriculum was not there for these children. Uh, and that's kind of how we worked directly. And we had about four centers at that point. Uh, the turning point came for us when uh, uh, you know, uh, there was an incident that happened at one of our, at our head center where, you know, we had a child, um, you know, his name is Sanskar and he has autism and uh, there was a documentary being shot on our work and uh, he was asked this question, uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? And uh, he said, I want to grow up, I want to go to office and I want to get married to my wife. Uh, you know, a very sweet thing to say, we all smiled and we, you know, we kind of uh, shook it over there at that point of time saying, well, you know, what a lovely response. Uh, but I think when we went back, uh, one realization came in that no matter what we are doing in our centers, no matter what we are doing in our organization, even a simple dream like this cannot be fulfilled because the world outside is not ready for Sanskar. The world outside is not ready uh, to include him um, in his journey further. Uh, he's been in such a protective environment. He's been within our schools and the entire environment is so, so different from what real life is. So therefore our shift, uh, you know, we kind of, it was a, a place where we just looked in the mirror and said, is this, if, if we can't offer a better future for him, is it really worth it? Uh, is everything that we are doing today leading to a better future for Sanskar? And if it's not, that means everything that we are doing is not sufficient. And we definitely need to think of what is it that we need to do? Uh, so it was kind of an existential crisis for us at that point of time. Um, and that's when our, our focus then became external because we knew that Okay, we, you can work with the children, uh, they can, uh, you know, be, uh, the, you can get them to achieve their education levels, but what happens when they go out? If the world outside is not ready to accept them, that means the change needs to happen externally. So all our focus therefore be moved from internal um, organization uh, work to externally looking at all stakeholders. And our focus again became inclusion. Why is inclusion not a reality? Why do we need to exist separately? Why do we need special schools today? when by law and by, um, you know, we have the best inclusion laws in India. In spite of that, why are we in the situation that we are in and what can we do to facilitate that? It's very easy to point fingers and say, hey, the government is not doing anything. 
uh, somebody else is not doing anything but do we have the solutions do we as experts in the sector have a solution at a scale like this at can we work at a state level can we work at a national level and say here's a solution for you to take and this is a solution that's possible in the resources that we have as a country today there are less than 4000 uh, specialists in a country like india and uh, if that's the number that we are talking about where is the question of having a special educator or a therapist in each school so that means you need a scalable solution that means you need to figure out a way till we don't reach that point we can't say let's let's go there from 4000 we are never going to reach uh, the millions that we need uh, today in our, in in our sector today uh, so that's where our shift then happened and we started working with various other ngos mainstream ngos to see what is the gap uh the gap was not just with them the gap was also for us we as a special education sector are also somewhere like frogs in a pond you know where we live very very parallel lives and and the reality of what it is to be in a mainstream school and the challenges that a teacher faces is not something that we are aware of it's can we as a, you know can we as a specialist go in that class of 40 with children with three different types of disabilities and teach the children in that class if we can't do it uh, we are no one to go and preach and say here's how you do it it's very easy to advise so that's when we said let's get into the teacher shoes let's understand what the challenges are and that's been our journey uh, we've developed inclusive learning content which not just um, works with uh, children with disabilities but across the classroom we can't have segregated solutions when we talk about inclusion we talk about every child we talk about every one in the class we talk about diverse needs of children we talk about gender sexuality um abilities everything so therefore what we've created now is is a model which is scalable we work with two state governments now with in madhya pradesh and tamil nadu to deploy these solutions in mainstream schools as mainstream solutions these are not external these are not special education solutions these are mainstream solutions because that's what we need so that's how we learnt as an organization that we can't give them special education solutions because that's not what they require they require mainstream solutions in our classroom um and that's been our journey um and of course a long way to go it's just beginning and uh, we're just seeing the shifts uh within what we are doing and and the success of what we are doing in a very very small way right now but a long journey to go thanks for sharing that sonali i think really um fascinating the lesson from Saranch and how that took Soul Sark as an organization that works to mainstream some of these practices at the system level it's really difficult work but much needed and look forward to unpacking what it really takes and what that means uh, in the session now again last but not least Sucheta I know Dream a Dream has gone through somewhat of a similar journey of working increasingly at systems level so we'd love to hear from you what that journey has been as well as your personal journey growing within Dream a Dream Yeah thank you thank you Diane I'm so inspired uh, just by listening to all my panelists introduce themselves I'm really looking forward uh, to the next hour and a half Um uh, my own journey I was born in you know considerable privilege in the sense that my parents uh, were reasonably well off. Uh my mother belonged to a scheduled caste and my father was brahmin so as a choice as a family uh, we are brahmin student I I come with that privilege I'm heterosexual cisgendered. Uh but what but one thing I know that there were two things my parents wanted from me before even I was born. One was they wanted me to be a boy I'm the third of three daughters. and second they wanted me to be an engineer uh, i was obviously not the boy so then i said okay i'll make up for it by becoming an engineer uh, and that was the journey of growing up right to close out all options to close out all possibilities of who i wanted to be what i wanted to explore and just follow the path of becoming an engineer which i did fairly well because i'm very good at memorizing facts uh, i joined the corporate sector i worked in the ibm uh, i worked in ibm telelogic different mncs uh but somewhere that that facade really just had to collapse and it was in between 2007 and 10 uh when it was not sustainable anymore for me to pretend that i was happy that this is my life journey and that's when i started volunteering uh with dream a dream and that really then opened my eyes to develop to the development sector to psychology to children education and i took to it like a fish to water right it was finally like this is my calling this is my purpose Uh, in 2010 i moved full time uh and within dream and dream it was again a whole um, 
unpacking of this privilege itself. When I came in, I was so sure I'm going to put up this brilliant, scalable strategy to solve the challenge of poverty uh, for marginalized children in the country. I was, you know, so confident about it. Uh, the last 10 years have been more of a humbling learning experience, uh, but I've realized that uh, the big part, the fact that I'm so privileged is actually a big part of the problem and not the solution. So how do I get out of the way? How do I help children find their own voices? How do I approach this from a place of my reflection and my journey versus there's others who need to change? So that has been the exploration and uh, some aspects of that have led me to what are different leadership styles. Uh, because for me, inclusion is, uh, is a cultural issue, is a leadership issue. It's not so much, while well, policy is an important outcome. Uh, I, I, I approach inclusion from the lens of, you know, even just as a feminine leader, not as a woman leader, but as a feminine style of leadership, does the world need a different type of leadership today? Uh, do we need a different lens to look at each other? How can a society built on empathy and trust uh, work for our children and help them thrive? So those, that's kind of my exploration as a leader. Uh, and within Dream and Dream, where that has led us to is that we are a 20 year old organization. I came in uh, 10 years into its journey. Uh, we've always looked at how can we develop life skills in children who come from marginalized backgrounds so that they can overcome adversity and be prepared for the fast pace of change in the world. Uh, over these 20 years, we've seen, you know, millions of children go through these programs. We work with st five state governments today to integrate life skills and social emotional based uh, programs into the school curriculum. Uh, but even with Dream and Dream, that's kind of where we reached that as much as I empower children, as much as they find their voices, when they were hitting 17, 18, 19, they were again still coming across these systemic barriers. Whether it's a girl child who then has to drop out and get married, whether it's a boy who has to start earning for his family. Uh, and that is really where we are today, that what must shift in education systems that can tackle these systemic biases that come in the way of marginalized children. My work is mainly with uh, socioeconomically marginalized, but I think, you know, I, I look at inclusion much more broadly than that. Uh, but what, how can we change systemic mindsets inside of education so that every child can thrive, irrespective of their social identities? Uh, so that's really me and the dream and dream is that today. Thank you, Sucheta. I think uh, we'll definitely pick up on that thread of exploring what are those systemic barriers that hold us back. Um, and yeah, just incredibly humbling and inspiring every time I hear your story and, and uh, thanks for sharing such a personal journey. Um, so as we get started, I wanted to just very directly ask our panelists today, the question that the Belong team gave us to solve for, um, which is what is an inclusive school? So maybe to kick us off, um, because we have the a benefit of technology, Saranj uh, had prepared a brief video from Bertha's uh, 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 school that she's been working with, the uh, Jyoti Surat School, that will, I think, give us a very visual sense and a, and a, and a feeling of what um, the school, an inclusive school looks like. So maybe we can start with that and I'll pass it along to Bertha to share um, her perspectives on an inclusive school and then open it up to the rest of the panelists. So looking back to the time uh, when we start inclusion in our school, that is in the year 2006, those days actually the school, Jyotis Road School, is exclusive meant for visually impaired. But as the years pass on, you know, pass by with the inclusion set up, we have children with different disabilities coming to our school and also with the, the children without any disability in our school studying together. And in fact, I will tell you who learns more from these children with disability are the children without disability. Because first thing is they learn to be together. They learn that no one is different from the other. All children are same in spite of their disabilities. Studying together, the spirit of working together, and the spirit of competitiveness and maybe motivation each other because the children without disability, when they look at the children with disability, they feel like, you know, uh, they can do it. So why not me? Thanks so much for um, sharing that. 
Uh, so over to you, Bertha. In your words, what does an inclusive school look like? What are maybe few characteristics that define an inclusive school? Communities, campuses, classrooms belong to everyone equally all the time. I'll be sharing uh, the learnings uh, from the project, um, which had been so uh, dynamically and in a very genius way led by our executive director, Kamo Narona of uh, Bethany Society. Um, not to waste time. We believe that an inclusive school looks at a learning framework which uh, looks at these four areas, the who, the where, the what, and the how of learning. The who is the learner. And when we talk about learners, we say that a child is born to learn. All children can learn. And in the process, they should emerge from their schooling as expert learners, not a state of arrival, but a state of becoming expert learners. We, we believe that this, the, for, we, we believe in looking at the diversity and the variability among the learners. And disability is only a part of the diversity. When we look at learners, an ideal inclusive school does not look at the biological or any identity of the learner, but it is the learning barriers in the child that should be addressed. Okay. Um, a child is a thinking, feeling, and doing being. And therefore, all these aspects should be considered the mental well being, the emotional well being, and the social well being of the child, in addition to addressing the intellectual needs of the child. Secondly, where? That is the learning environment. And when we talk about the learning environment, we look at the physical environment where it has to be accessible, where it has to be safe, ensuring the presence, the participation, and the achievement of each learner in that learning space. And um, we all know, uh, I mean, we are all very familiar about physical environment. And sadly enough that this has been the focus of all inclusive education drives from the national level, state level, everywhere. It's, you know, building ramps, uh, accessible toilets, all that. But it's more to that. And I mean, with uh, the concept of inclusive education and schools having to be inclusive, um, the infrastructure had always been meant for persons with no additional needs. So retrofitting is difficult to improve on the infrastructure, but we have to be more creative to, uh, to create learning spaces in the present condition, because uh, this has always been the a cry from the government schools that they don't have an infrastructure. 
but it is it is not difficult certainly it needs a lot of work to be done but infrastructure campuses approaches to them can always be made more accessible and safe for our children physically safe we also talk about the um, psychosocial environment and i think in the present uh, century this is the most important area that we have to look in because we said a child's mental emotional and um, social well-being must come with equal uh, significance as to providing for their intellectual needs so uh, working on the uh, psychosocial environment and this is where policies come in for schools that really aspire to become inclusive they have to re revisit their policies in uh, uh, their policies like um, policies like policies on inclusive education child protection child safeguarding as we call it now gen gender sensitivity and uh, gender equality and policies on uh, disaster readiness um, for the safety of children so um, this is about the way of learning now the heart of inclusive education is in the classroom teaching and learning i'd already mentioned that too much focus had been put on the physical environment but not much work has been uh, even thought about you know improving on the teaching and learning processes in the classrooms which really define what inclusive education is all about the what of learning the what is we have to look at the curriculum and curriculum is a set of learning opportunities and the curriculum must include the academics the non scholastics the co scholastics any learning need learning space that needs to be worked upon um then more importantly in order to achieve the goal of inclusive education or inclusive teaching it's the how that means the first we have the how of teaching learning that is the pedagogy and secondly we have the how of assessment and evaluation um there is a belief and there is a dream that in each of the inclusive classrooms the teaching approach should be unified where we avoid parallel approaches to learning as is currently practice in most parts of our country that is not inclusive education we have to look at frameworks that contributes towards this unified system of teaching and learning and uh, in the race project we have adopted the universal design for learning from where uh, also has come out the inclusive lesson plan designing where a teacher works 
on one lesson plan only, noting the learning barriers in the children and through multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement and multiple means of action and expression, children learn. And this framework has helped us because uh, we do not look at the syllabus, the total syllabus, the bulky syllabus that is prescribed by any board or uh, by any board, whether national or state. We need to focus more on learning concepts and skills and do away with knowledge acquisition, which is always vomited out during examinations. And how do we make sure that learning happens? In order to achieve the heart of inclusive education, we need to shift from uh, knowledge acquisition to deep understanding of learning, by which children then, all children, will be taught the skills that are especially needed in the 21st century. Now, the how of assessment and evaluation. This, I mean, what do we do in India? You know, examinations. We are so focused on examinations. Children, parents, teachers, it's, it's the marks, it's the percentage that count. And usually this does not indicate that the child has learned. His intellectual abilities have not been explored and used to the fullest. So, but in order for that to happen, it's high time that formative assessment is made a must. The new education policy does speak on this, but a policy is a policy. It's a dead, uh, dead words unless we are willing. But still we hear that many schools, many teachers are still for the summative evaluation. Of course, we do need examinations. We do need tests, but unless we practiced formative assessment during every uh, teaching time or learning time, we will not know whether the child has learned or not. And we can guarantee that when children's learning gaps are identified and the proper scaffolding takes place, children will learn and that will reduce the dropout, um, the dropout rate in our country. Um, yeah, I think for the moment, I'll stop with that, Tiang. Thank you, Bertha. That was such a rich and comprehensive overview of what inclusive schools and education systems look like um, and what a helpful framework of the who, where, what, and how. Um, it was incredibly useful. Also the mental shifts we need to make. Um, I see Nilakshi, you've unmuted yourself. So yeah. I you want to come in and build on any of that. Yeah, um, I really want to add very little, but you know, I will be concentrating. Um, unlike many of you who are uh, probably, you know, uh, much more committed to the uh, policy changes, I will be concentrating in most of my deliberations on the classroom. Okay, so I'll just be talking about the classroom. But um, you know, uh, to me, an inclusive school is. Um, inclusive right from the watchman's behavior right up to the principal's desk, okay? And of course the classroom lies somewhere in between. So for me, an inclusive school is a space where dialogue is possible. It's a place where listening without judgment is possible. I mean, 
whether it is the teachers who are peers, whether it is the students and the teachers, or whether the students are talking amongst themselves, or whether it is the, the cleaning personnel and the support staff that run the school, the bus driver or whoever it is. So listening without judgment is something which is very, very important in, in terms of inclusivity. Despite, again, as Bertha said, despite all the policies that are written down and enshrined and stuck on the walls everywhere and displayed because you know the authorities want it. I mean, I'm from a college and I know therefore. So yeah, um, alongside all of this, of course, there ought to be anti-bullying policies and measures, which are very, very obvious and visible. Unless these are there, you know, they, they, they will never be a deterrent. I'm, I'm really sorry to say this, but certain uh, things need to be, to, to have a sort of a more a slightly harsher approach. You know, I'm not saying punitive, but uh, definitely um, counseling or warning or whatever, you know anti-bullying policies and measures right from uh, very, very early times ought to be uh, there. Also, uh, a truly inclusive classroom is one which, uh, you know, has, which, which has all kinds of students in it. So, you know, the, the that old method of, of uh, you know, either alphabetically, uh, just, just to be very arbitrary, alphabetically uh, designing the classroom or uh, putting together as a token, you know, people uh, from from different uh, uh, communities together, or something like that. One has to definitely find out a more robust method of forming the classroom itself. You know, from your pool of students, your thirty or your fifty, whatever you want to decide, that needs to be definitely uh, a more inclusive space by itself. Um, I also feel very strongly that uh, you know, for a truly inclusive uh, classroom experience students ought to learn from each other. Children ought to learn from each other. So peer counseling, peer mentoring, uh, peer exchange in terms of learning, uh, I think these are definitely also for remedial uh, coaching. Many schools do practice all this, I know that. But just generally more peer group learning, I think is something that will definitely point towards more uh, holistic and more inclusive practices. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Nalakshi. It's great to see kind of from the moment you step into this, the, the school grounds, um, what are all the different very tangible yeah. things schools can do. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Great. So Nali, did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I kind of, I mean, both um, Bertha and Nalakshi's really put a perspective both in terms of frameworks as well as how a school and how everybody in school should be. I think I, I really agree to the fact that attitude is everything. If every person in the school is thinking of, uh, is acceptable and accepts every person in the classroom, you've, you've won the battle. It doesn't matter whether there is physical access, it doesn't matter whether uh, there are e-learning aids, it doesn't matter at all. I saw this beautiful video a couple of uh, days back where uh, there was this child in South India um, and he was he had physical disability. Uh, the schools in the, his village wouldn't take him and uh, the whole community, all the children in the village um, and the parents made a, a temporary uh, wheelchair with a chair and a cart and they would take him kilometers to the next village uh, for the child to be able to learn. Uh, through rivers and through um, through uh, terrains and made him reach there. So it doesn't really matter what you have today. Uh, and we can't say, let the school first be resourceful and then let's include children. It doesn't work like that at all. Attitude is everything. So when we talk about inclusion in our classroom, we talk about every last child. Is every last child in your classroom learning? Because nothing else matters. Is every last child feeling included? Is every last child feeling safe? And if we've achieved that, we've achieved inclusion. There is no, um, I would put all the science in one, on one side and attitude on the other and, and still weigh attitude more than anything else. If the teacher fails, if the teacher accepts the fact that every child in the classroom is her responsibility, she'll make one way or the other, make it happen and make sure that the child is learning. So that's really what inclusion is. For. Yeah, thanks, Unali. The attitude is everything. I'll take away as a quote. And Sucheta, you also mentioned the, just the importance of culture and leadership um, mm -hmm. to build an inclusive 
education system and organization. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I, I wanted to kind of bring in because again, I agree with everything. And after Bertha, there was not much to add in terms of an inclusive school. Uh, so I want to take a more conceptual or you know, you, you might even call it philosophical take on the education system itself, right? Just beyond an inclusive school. But when we look at our education system today, uh, and for that to give, uh, you know, a little bit context in terms of how I reached uh, this place is that, so when Dream Dream started, we were really, you know, we, the goal was to work with children who came from marginalized backgrounds, but we didn't necessarily know what to do. So we started doing arts-based programs, sports-based programs and orphanages, uh, children who were in juvenile homes, cancer affected children. And the more we did these programs, we realized that these experiences were say increasing their confidence, were increasing their ability to interact, to build relationships. And that's how the program evolved to develop life skills in children who come from adversity. And we realized that when you come from a space or from an environment where you're exposed to early experiences of violence, malnutrition, lack of love and care in the families, instable, this has an impact on the development of children itself. So when we're looking at marginalized children, there's, you know, 48% children in India who are stunted, which basically tells you that while their physical growth is stunted, their psychological development is also stunted, that they're not developing the skills that a child in a mainstream home or school might be developing, which then means as they grow older, as they look for jobs, the cycle of poverty continues because they don't have the skills then. Uh, you know, to respond to society, to respond to the job market. So that's kind of how the program started evolving. Uh, like I said, today we work with five different state governments to integrate these life skills based programs, which help children develop confidence, manage conflict, think critically, problem solve all of these skills inside uh, classrooms and inside uh, school systems. And we especially work with government school children, thinking, you know, with the assumption that. Uh, the socioeconomically uh, marginalized children go to government schools. Uh, but where, actually, let me tell you a story also, just to make this come alive and, you know, where that reflection has taken us. So Amika was part of our program. She joined us uh, when she was just entering college. She was extremely shy. Her father was a vegetable vendor. Mother was a homemaker. Uh, and, you know, the family had this, as can be expected, the family thought that going to college is the ticket out of poverty and that's kind of academics as a way out of this. Uh, so when she came to us, she joined our life skills programs. We even gave her a scholarship to join college. But the more she attended these life skills programs, explored who she is, she actually discovered she enjoys baking, right? It was a chance volunteer engagement with somebody and she started baking. And that's when she realized that was her passion. So we had to then reverse kind of work with her and her family for her to drop out of college and actually join baking school and become a baker. Uh, she went on then to actually work in a five-star at Bangalore as a, as a pastry chef. Uh, and we thought, you know, this is great. She's set for life. But the pandemic hit. And even the five stars in the city, they just laid off their employees with one week notice. Right? And so that, that really brings up the question, what is our education system doing to prepare children for these kind of life choices, for them to find who they are and then deal with crisis, deal with uncertainty and deal with the challenges that come with the, you know, just life in general, but definitely if you're coming from adversity. Uh, and that is where today I, when I look at schools, so when I look at education systems, my take is that a truly inclusive education system will provide equal and equ equitable opportunities for every child to thrive. Uh, and every child is a given. I think my co-panelists have beautifully described that, right? How inclusion is not what you do separately and every child must be included. Uh, but I want to focus more on the aspect of thriving because thriving for me is when we allow children to define success for themselves beyond these traditional notions, beyond traditional notions of be good at academics, go to college, get a job and that is the only way you can be successful because children have so many different abilities, aspirations and uh, life choices that are available to them. How can we destigmatize that? How can we make success a lot more broader so that every child has an opportunity to thrive? Uh, and how do we measure ourselves on that, right? Can we celebrate if there is a homosexual, different label child becomes an artist? Right? Is our education systems creating spaces for that? 
uh, is our education system creating spaces for a Dalit person in rural India becoming a cardiologist or becoming, you know, a, a scientist, right? A rocket scientist. Are we creating those spaces for that? Can we truly imagine maybe a Muslim woman becoming the prime minister of this country? So for me, education system is a reflection of this culture of our society itself and who we are. And can we reimagine education systems which will require us to reimagine society itself? Uh, and that for me is an inclusive education system where every child has an equal and equitable opportunity to thrive, to choose who they want to be and live unique, personal, purposeful lives. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so Bertha earlier mentioned that, you know, we have some of the most inclusive laws um, in the world in this country. And I think Nilakshi and Sonali also share that, you know, even though resources are important, they shouldn't be a barrier. And there are many ways to become inclusive. Um, but we saw earlier in the opening poll that many people have uh, gone through schools that are not very inclusive. And an average school in India is still very far from that. So Sucheta, you mentioned just the importance of kind of building that culture, um, but what, what, what are the barriers at that system level? Um, if we have some good laws, resources are not, you know, at the end all be all, why aren't schools inclusive today or more schools inclusive today? Yeah. Can you see me? For me, I, I really come down to that, that uh, like Bertolt said, we have, uh, or I think Nilakshi said, that we have some of the best laws in terms of inclusion, uh, you know, and RT itself in terms of inclusion, even of children from marginalized groups. But for me, inclusion is not, while policies is a very necessary and, uh, you know, important outcome, inclusion for me is a, is a cultural phenomenon. And uh, I agree with, you know, what Bertha said, but Dr. Roy also said about her sister that when we look at education systems today itself, just mainstream regular education, it is based on the idea of exclusion, right? Every time a child takes a test or an exam, the idea is that how can I weed out? How can I weed out the not fast learners? How can I weed out the non 10% in a broad definition of success, right? So it's a cultural phenomenon, exams and the, and the funneling of what finally ends up as success. And if I were to take say IIT, right? Today it's considered the epitome of success of our education system. 250 million children start primary education in India. 10,000 to 15,000 get into IIT. Look at that funnel of exclusion. It's a, it's a deeply rooted, even desire I think many of us have to be considered as part of this 10%, to be considered, oh, I got into IIT. So while laws and policies can, can support it, unless we are able to create this mindset shift, right, about, about marginalization. So this is mainstream. So let me now add the layer of marginalization, right? This is mainstream education. There's the school I heard about in Tamil Nadu, which, and I'm sure it's quite common in other schools, where teachers started putting a band around the children's hand. And it was like, you sit with this, with the children who have the same band, you play with the children who have the same band. At first look, it might think, you know, they're just trying to do some efficient group management. But the more you went into it, you realized the bands were actually based on the cost of the child. So it was a new age way to segregate children, you know, based on their cost. And you can only play, eat, sit with children from your same cost, right? In our own life skills assessments, when we do a baseline of children, when we start our programs, we realize that consistently schools that are in more Muslim communities, their life skills, they start off with lower life skills, even when compared to schools which are marginalized, but are more in Hindu dominated uh, communities, right? There's a difference even there. We know the pandemic has impacted girls more. We know more girls are gonna drop out of school uh, when schools reopen and they have had less access to online learning. Uh, so all of this, right, it can't be solved at a school level. It has to be solved at a cultural level. It has to be an acceptance that there is a resistance to break the systemic, entrenched generational powers, systems of power, privilege, which has served some of us, definitely served me as a woman of privilege, uh, and look beyond that, right? 
look beyond just a 25% RTE quota, look beyond just laws for children for special ability, but be willing to shift our mindsets about inclusion uh, and exclusion uh, and look at a system which is, you know, like I said, more equitable for all children, respect, irrespective of the social identities that they come from, so that every child can thrive. Yeah, thanks, Richetta. I think if I may add a couple of things here, um, you know, I think just look at the way we build capacity, the way we look at the way we do the evaluations. What is the criteria for all these things? It's all learning. All the other problems in the classroom are invisible. So everything else, whether uh, it is a, a mental health challenge that a child is facing, whether it's a disability that a child is facing, whether it is a trauma that the child has gone through because of something that's recently happened in their classrooms, everything's invisible to the teacher. We haven't built capacities of, of the system, of teachers, of educators, of the um, people in the administrative systems to understand these risks. So we don't talk about risks in a classroom. We don't talk about the risks that children have. What is critical is for whenever the teachers, whether it's pre-service training, whether it's, um, uh, you know, whether we're looking at in-service training, all the teachers need to be aware of what is to be done when a child with a specific need is there in your classroom. Does a teacher know what happens if, a let's say, if a child is going through a panic attack, would the teacher understand that it's a panic attack? And how do you manage that? What if a child is showing suicidal symptoms? Does she know what to do with the child then? What if the child comes up and says that she, the child has been abused? <laughs> Does she have any idea of what is to be said to this child? All the focus is on learning pedagogy, and this becomes an invisible problem that the schools and the teachers don't deal with because the system or the or the way we've built our education system doesn't look at any of these parameters, doesn't look at the child as a whole. Even when we identify risk, right? When we identify a disability, we only say this child is learning disability. Have we looked at other factors that's affecting this child? Uh, the mental state of the child, the demographic that that child comes from, uh, the challenges that the child, the family is facing at home. So because it is such, a, even, even when we are doing identification, and this is we as a sector in the special needs space are doing identification, the identification is so narrow that we are only there for addressing only that. Are we looking at the other challenges that the child is facing? And um, that's the only way by capacitating the teachers, by capacitating the system and making this a part of everyday uh, learning or everyday interaction, the teacher needs to deal with it. The message is just as simple as that. The way you're looking at learning, we need to look at the social emotional needs of the child. We need to look at the mental health challenges that the child is facing in the classroom. If you're able to build that capacity, it's very easy to say nothing's happening. Well, the teacher doesn't know how to that teachers never been taught that it's not a part of our system. The schools are never told that you have to manage the social emotional needs of a child. It's only recent that recently that this is coming and it's at a very superficial level at this point of time. You know, when we talk about the happiness curriculum, when we talk about various things that are happening, does it mean that the teacher knows what to do in critical conditions? Or is, is it just one layer up? So I think just making a school aware of the risks, capacitating them to deal with these risks, and understanding how to very simply, without the jargons in place and without everything that we all as professionals do, simplifying things for a teacher and saying, hey, here are the three things that you can do immediately before a professional comes in, in the picture. Um, I think just that itself will open up the teacher's mind to seeing this invisible problem in the classroom. Let me wrap that up. <laughs> Not wrap. I mean, uh, thank you for all the, contrib for the contributions. Um, for me, these words come again. Lawmakers, policy makers, whatever, they look at the what is written, but nothing is considered about the why and the how, as our previous speakers had said. So uh, that is why our laws remain dead. And it would have been better if the people who had put these policies in place, do a certain follow up on how it is implemented, put expectations, and also, um, what was I going to say? Uh, and also see that the implications, that implications that the policies bring in 
are to, uh, properly looked into. As we say about, uh, I mentioned about the focus on the physical environment, but we all know that nobody has done anything about the curriculum, but I hope that will be taken up uh, with the new education policy. That we live with a curriculum that is one size fits all. But it, for, the, for the proper achievement of inclusive education and meeting the needs of every learner in the classroom, the curriculum must fit the child and not the child fits or adjusts himself, herself into the curriculum. These are just examples. Yeah, thanks, Bertha. And it was, I think, important for us to understand the systemic context, how the education system is actually built to so singularly focus on academic outcomes and essentially kind of fueling this philosophy of funneling from early age to identify the high performers, to move on to the next level and to signal, right? Um, in the backdrop of all of that, of course, as Bertha mentioned, and many of you have mentioned, the NEP gives new hope, um, but wanted to turn to Nilakshi, as you think about what this all means for an individual school, and if there are educators and school leaders who are really passionate about making change within their school, how does a school that has all of these pressures almost free oneself and get started on this journey amidst all of these challenges? Um, so you mean to say, how do we transform the culture of a school? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So. The system is what it is. It's going to take some time. There are wonderful yeah. organizations yeah. working on that. But if I'm an educator and looking at my classroom or school leader and just thinking about my school, where do I get started? OK. Um, yeah. Um, to transform a culture of a school or whatever, then you know, the, there are, is that the question that you're addressing that, you know, that um, are you talking about the bias that uh, or exclusions that are there? Or are you talking about, uh, you know, really the starting off point. Yeah, I think I think the culture point is really important because many of you have mentioned that attitude is everything yeah. and that doesn't depend on having okay. extra resources. And I know your organization explicitly works yes. to build that yes. awareness. So yes. yeah, I think you can yeah. focus there. So you know what, um, according to uh, whatever we have found in spaces which are actually managing this well, that is in countries abroad, not only are uh, notice boards displayed everywhere, but they have detailed policy documents running into 21 pages of fine print on how to handle a transgender, exactly what uh, the previous speaker was talking about, how to handle a transgender student, what, what about differently abled students, what are the toolkits for a teacher in a classroom, what are the best practices in these kinds of ideas. There are school assessment forms which are geared towards this, so you know, there, there is, you know, it is it is a more enabling environment for a teacher who also wants to make that difference. In our spaces, even if a teacher or a school or a management wants to make a difference, provisions are not there. You know, you'll have to overstep a whole lot of um, invisible hurdles in order to get there. So, you know, counseling counselors are not employed with proper training. Okay, there are uh, MA counseling students waiting to be employed by schools, but then the school appoints, uh, you know, a, a teacher with a humanities degree and also, you know, uses that teacher as a counselor. So, you know, these are some of the drawbacks and the loopholes in our uh, system, which definitely are, 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 are the dangers. So the parents, the teachers, the peer groups and the civil society organizations need to, you know, partner in all of this. And uh, definitely the big role that a particular school has to play is uh, lies in the hands of the school authorities or the management in employing the right kind of people to deal with it. 
Okay, so at Swikar or at say NAS Foundations or Association for Transgender Health in India, there are many of us who are working to create such documents. You know, discussions have taken place on the NEP and on other things to for inclusivity. So many of the references that I am making in my talk and I am going to still make are you know collective inputs from all of these spaces where we have spoken together and thrashed these ideas about. One can find many, many ways in which this kind of inclusive practices are taking place every day in schools abroad. There are multiple uh, documents available. I'm not saying that we import them whole, heart and whole and soul. I'm saying evaluate those, scrutinize them. Let us see whether we can modify them. Let us see how we can adapt them to our context. What would be useful to our country? Maybe something very rudimentary to start with, but we need something, you know. As you were asking, we definitely need something. So yeah, so the school has uh, a lot of things to do. The government is, of course, as you, we know, uh, taking many slow steps. But a school itself can celebrate difference in a very big way. You know, celebrating difference is a big thing. So what we often do is we have a token day, you know, like a blue day for autism. And that is one day in which everybody participates. And the autistic children do not get to decide what they want okay or just to to be present to showcase who they are and how how they are and how they are celebrating life themselves every day every day in their life is a challenge and therefore every day is a celebration so you know sometimes we we make programs just for the sake of it so celebrations ought to be more inclusive. They ought to come from those who uh, whose identity they are celebrating. You know, the, or the school is celebrating. So that is so they should be spearheading the program rather than being led. Despite the, your thought that they are probably not going to be able to do this, only a teacher can design the program. You know, so there are many interesting ways, and you know, maybe difficult, maybe very challenging ways in which uh, schools can definitely become more uh, inclusive. The government, of course, if you're asking questions about the government now, or you want me to move uh, later about it? I, I can sure, sure, feel free to. Okay. If, I, if, I, if I can go ahead, yeah. So the government yes. is definitely making uh, meaningful steps, slow steps, but meaningful steps. I am more hopeful of the judiciary also. They have made excellent judgments uh, in recent times, in the past five years, especially, very notoriously you know, uh, hopeful and, and very uh, forthcoming and very, let us say, um, encouraging and actually almost uh, landmark judgments in many areas. Okay, But you know, we have to look downwards as well. That is the topmost level, but everything cannot you know, happen at the top only. So the onus is there on all of us, you know, you, me, uh, you know, as parents. I remember the day that uh, my sister would be bullied, she would come diving back on into the sofa in the, in the, in the drawing room, scatter all her bags and just keep crying for about half an hour. I mean, that, that scene is permanently etched in my mind that what a child goes through when he or she is bullied. So it's not just the government which can do things. It is you and me every day who must, you know, stop talking about discriminatory practices at home when we are bringing up a child. Okay, so a school or an education system is but a representation. It's just a microcosm of the society we live in. So we can't dump everything on the teacher, you know, and we can't say, Chalo, you do a revolution, okay, teacher, you better do it. You change the mindset of the children while we go on beating up a gay man for cruising or for looking for an inch of privacy in the, the already crisis-driven uh, small urban spaces for where CISET lovers are struggling against the border police. So, you know, we beat up everybody, but, you know, you teachers, you do your job. You're not doing the right thing. I think that's that's the biggest danger that you know we face as a system, as a country, where we dump and lump everything on the school and the teacher, whether it is good or bad, saying that that's where it all has to start. What about the home? What about the values that you have inculcated in your child? You know, right from where she or she is developing, uh, or they are developing their uh, gender identity. So if you go to start thinking about it, it, goes to very, very deep roots. And indeed, hats off to a government which will be finally able to halt this race sometime in the future. I am very hopeful, as I am telling you, towards more and more, uh, you know, ending discrimination and prejudice. So it is for the ministries, it is for the national boards, it is for the state boards, for, for the accreditation agencies to be relentless against discrimination. Similarly, it is for each of us 
as parents, as you know, as as friends, as teachers, as guides, to 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 wake up to this call. You know, so we we need to join hands with uh, everyone, with parents and teaching communities, people working independently or NGOs, as we have here in this space. That's probably the only option left now. You know. That's the only option left to to join hands in a in a partnership, which is which is an ongoing thing. And you know, I don't know whether some of you are aware. Maybe many of you are aware that an entire documentation has been prepared by a community-based collective to strengthen the draft national education policy. It is available in the uh, public domain. You know, a lot of details are given there. I will be talking about that later if if I have the time. But uh, People are working, you know, even for the draft uh, NEP. So the government and the representatives of the government, if they are here, please take notice. Please consider these as very valid suggestions, you know, and to end exclusion in, in uh, all respects. So ex exclusion in terms of language, terminology, dress, facial expression or gesture when you're talking about a certain type of a person in the class, you know, a disabled person or a, a you know, gay person or a transgender person. The, the way that we use food as, as exclusion, who sits near whom, who gets to the teacher, the games and the teams that are formed, the hangout time, the birthday parties, the lift and drop home, even the walk home, who gets to walk with whom. You know, these are all the kinds of things that children are facing every day and the government cannot do anything about it. The government cannot do anything about it. This is something that we have to do as individuals. So every time we point fingers at the government, let us see that, you know, the, the four fingers that point back towards us, let us also strengthen, you know, our own personal lives, our own private personal spaces to, to, to change, uh, bring about social change. Yeah, it's Lakshi. And that message I think really resonates, especially in today's times, right? where we've been talking a lot about the school and, and kind of envisioning what it means to walk into a physical school. But we all know that for the last year and ongoing, none of our children have actually been to our traditional notion of a school. School has come home, right? And so this idea that the values that we inculcate, the discrimination that we often reinforce um, you know, implicitly in our homes, has become even more important. And we went almost over an hour. It's one of the few panels that I think I've done, we've done that without even talking about the COVID context and the pandemic. But of course, as we all know, that's also um, been extremely unequal, the impacts of that and how that manifests in the lives of our children and students. And you know that remote learning, for example, and access to technology is unequal, and that sort of exacerbated the experiences and left behind many uh, groups of children. And so on that, maybe I'll pass to Sonali, who's I know done a lot of work in this area. What are the ways in which exclusion is happening in this new COVID context? And can technology help solve that? So far, there's been large digital divide, right? What are the ways that we can actually use technology to solve some of that digital divide and not exacerbate it? Um, I think as one of the panelists spoke, uh, that you know, exclusion has come out so so clearly uh, in the COVID times. It's not that not just the vulnerable children who are getting excluded, but a large population today who's got excluded because the way our system is built, the way our education uh, is built, is meant is not meant to be inclusive. So how do we kind of shift that? So we always talk about building back better and say that let's not go back to the old system because that's clearly broken. Uh, during the COVID times, not only is our majority, not, not more than 15 to 20% of children had access to digital devices. And children with special needs, children with disabilities didn't have accessible uh, at accessibility at all to any of these programs. I think that was the last thing on any government's mind, on any initiative's mind, in terms of what do we do to reach out to these children? They just completely vanished. They were already invisible. I think they've just vanished during the COVID times now, saying, let's not deal with this problem. There are many other problems to deal with. So the prioritization has been uh, not towards the most vulnerable, unfortunately, but towards the large population. And one of the things to understand really is that if we build any solution with the most vulnerable in mind, you're going to benefit the entire population. 
So if you built a solution thinking of a child with disability in mind, your accessibility, your content, the way you were delivering things would benefit not just that child, but everybody who was already there. It's because we are thinking the other way around uh, is where most of the children are getting excluded. Think of the weakest link, think of the most vulnerable child and then build a solution so that everybody is included. The way our digital solutions are getting built today, the way our evaluations are getting built today, the way the whole COVID intervention ha has panned out in many, many uh, states is not is completely left out the ch a child with disabilities, completely le left out the vulnerable children who were anyway almost out of the system. They were anywhere the borderline. They've just been moved out completely. Uh, so I, I think COVID has created havoc um, and just brought out the inequities which were anyways there. I think we just didn't speak about it before, but I think because the inequities have increased across the population, we are now today talking about the inequities. Um, so a lot of solutions need to be built around uh, ex any, any solution for that matter, whether it is during COVID, whether it is after COVID, has to be built around the most vulnerable child in mind, has to be accessible to the large population, and thought of from that vulnerable child's perspective. We can't lose that lens in anything that we build, especially in a country like India where uh, a large population is vulnerable, right? I mean, look at the uh, one in two children get abused. Look at the population. I mean, look at the challenges, the risks that we are, all our kids are facing. And that has to be considered. For example, I mean, the cases of abuse have gone up during this time. Um, but this wasn't thought of and we built solutions when we started online access uh, to various things. What would happen then? So really just uh, the, the situation is uh, worsened definitely for the most vulnerable as for all the children. So the only message I would say is really go back to a better system, build back better, think of this as a learning rather than going back to the same broken system and saying, okay, now the schools have started, let's go back to where we were. Nilakshi, did you want to pick up on the build back better? Yeah, just very quickly. Yeah, um, I think uh, again, emphasis on psychological health, uh, social psychological health, very important. The fact that you know the students have to go back to discipline, the uh, back to opening up. You know, are you know not being very uh, you know exclusive and kind of self-centered or preoccupied with their own things. Back to normalizing, despite maybe bereavement, personal loss you know, disease at home and all kinds of things, experiences which the pandemic has thrown up, uh, loss of jobs of the parents and, you know, economic uh, instability. Uh, location, you know, they have, many people have shifted uh, spaces. So that has also caused a lot of tension in the mind of the child probably. So generally the ominousness of the threat of the pandemic, that is something that they need to probably help to be, to maybe often undermine this, uh, you know, thinking that they will cope. But then, you know, it, it is difficult. So probably I think the initial uh, months or maybe uh, initial time that uh, the, the syllabus driven, uh, uh, you know, school uh, boards should, should think about is to give children some time for counseling and rehabilitation rather than, you know, pump them with more uh, learning and education. Let them have some time to, to just catch up and to be at some kind of a level of comfort. So many of our students have stopped coming so can we get them back? They have uh, not paid admission fees. They have not paid exam fees. They have not bought the books. They are attending class sometimes, but you know they, they are just out of the pale of uh, exams. So what about those? So probably these two things are, are more needed. If they don't come back, then why? And if they have come back, then rehabilitation and uh, psychological uh, counseling and looking at the psychological health, very, very important things. Much more than you know, getting back with academics and performing uh, like you know, very brilliant uh, students. Right. And I wanted to hear from Bertha, from your experience and perhaps from the experience of the Jyoti Surat School during this really tough time. Do you have any advice for us on how to reach um, students who are really hard to reach, students with special needs remotely in their homes? Okay. Uh, specifically with the children of Jyoti's Road School, we are very fortunate because in the villages, uh, Bethany Society uh, connects with 7,000 villages where we have CPR programs, mental health programs, and the workers on the field have also been um, trained in some way or the other in inclusive education. 
So whenever these uh, CBR workers, CBID workers, any of those uh, can access the homes, because that also depends on the permission given from the local leaders. So if they can, they support these children with, mm, forget ac ac academic needs, yes, but just being there, just to connect with them, just to support the family, you know, just to know that they are not by themselves. Um, then uh, at another level, you said it very right, De Jong, when you said that now the school has gone home. I mean, because why? As I said, teaching and learning, how do teachers teach now? Uh, they, I mean, we cannot blame them. They've not been trained, nobody saw this. And teachers are using the usual method, the lecture method. They lecture using, uh, what do they use? Google Classrooms, they use uh, whatever, and um, apps, they, they, they record their explanations and send them by WhatsApp or whatever. But children are not learning. So in the last year, 2020, uh, during the pandemic, uh, Bethany Society through Kamu did a lot of research into um, uh, using ICT for improving teaching, learning, be it for children uh, with um, disabilities or no disabilities. But when I say uh, that it's usually children with, you know, I mean, intellectual disability, of course, will be a bit limited. The multiple disability, you need one-to-one, -one, and that's when our field workers visit them, if possible. But a lot of discovery had been made by Sir um, in terms of learning platforms and apps that brings in interactive teaching. I can name a few, you know, like, uh, like the Nearpod lesson planning. Then we have the Edmodo. What else, Shubu? Uh, uh, Socrative, uh, Socrative read for works. read works. All these um, uh, the apps that help interactive teaching embedded with formative assessment. So there and there, the teachers design these online lesson plans on Nearpod, where the assessment activities are embedded. And along, the, uh, along with the um, teaching that half an hour or 40 minutes, children keep interacting through their, um, uh, keep interacting while answering questions or doing activities. So it can work a lot. It's just that where well, we have other logistic uh, complications and we don't have enough, but where it works, use of these different apps has really helped and our partner NGOs also have been introduced into this but of course expertise and mastery over that will still take a long time but there is a policy a, a, a possibility that online teaching and learning can be improved but it we need every stakeholder in the system from top to bottom to facilitate this yeah, thanks, Bertha, for those very um, concrete tips. We may follow up with you on the names of those tools and share that back with the audience. Um, but before we move to the audience Q&A shortly, as a quick reminder, if you have any questions, I think we've only received one so far, so please start, uh, keep them coming. You actually and Sonali both mentioned the importance of building back better, not just go back to the status quo, not uh, give in to our urge to cram syllabus to make up and catch up uh, students on sort of knowledge right acquisition, but really help them take a step back, absorb and make sense out of this traumatic experience that they've gone through, support them with counseling and so forth. I know Sucheta Dream a Dream has also thought a lot about uh, what going back to school might look like. And as you think about almost your ideal of the first, let's say, 100 days back to school, what are some of the top of mind things that you want all of us to keep in mind to make sure we do and don't do? Sure. Again, um, I agree with 
everything that has been shared. I think I might just adjust what Sonali said because what I've been saying is not build back better, but build back different, right? Better and fundamentally different. Uh, because that's one of the risks I'm seeing that uh, there is right now definitely, you know, like I said, it's been 20 years and we started off with life skills and mental health being considered this elitist thing you do after children learn how to read and write to today really becoming a much more mainstream conversation that children are high for mental health challenges, the pandemic has stressed them out, there is high levels of anxiety and how can we respond as education systems to that. Uh, but the risk we are sitting on right now is again, whether it's mental health, social psychological skills, it is again becoming this add-on, right? Just like our panelists spoke about inclusion of people with disability, inclusion of people with se different sexual orientations. It's not considered an integration into the system, but can I add a happiness class? Can I do a well-being session for 40 minutes for all my 18,000 teachers at one shot? Right? That is the risk we are sitting on right now. And that's why I say not just better. It's not enough to just teach them about trauma response or uh, include psycholo psychologists in school or campuses, but to think about this entirely differently. It is a one time, once in a lifetime opportunity where unfortunately we are in the middle of a pandemic, but schools were shut for 400 days, right? Who would have thought? Why can't then we choose this opportunity? We had 400 days we did nothing about it but at least now to think about this whole system of learning education fundamentally differently so while i subscribe that in the first 90 days absolutely no academics reintegration help children make sense of the grief the loss the anxiety the 400 days where they had no control over a routine of getting up in the morning and going to school, right? These were so important. These routines were so important for children. Schools were safe spaces for children where they could go out of abusive environments, go out of stifling smaller homes and actually go to school. So help them make sense of all of that. That is definitely the first 90 days. Potentially a year, no examinations, no testing of rote learning, no testing of you know, unit tests, final exams, the amount the Karnataka government has spoken about the board exams other than the third way which will potentially hit our children is, is almost comical, right? We have been so involved in should we do a board exam or not? When children are losing parents, children are losing family members, they're going through so much stress and anxiety. So like just clear all that out. But with that 90 days, with that one year plan, let's look at education differently. Let's ask ourselves, what are the skills? What are the competencies? What do children, especially marginalized children need to thrive in this complex, unpredictable world to respond to these challenges, which are gonna be mainstream, you know, regular occurrences in their present and future. And how can education systems prepare them to respond to that with a sense of resilience, with a sense of flexibility, adaptability, empathy, um, and, you know, like be ahead of it versus spend 400 days in anxiety and uh, what are you calling loss of learning? So that would, what I would say in terms of how we can reimagine this whole thing. Thanks, Ucheta. So really inspiring note to not only build back better, but build back entirely differently. How can we reimagine, take this as an opportunity also to reset and reimagine what our education systems need to do to be inclusive. Um, so on that note, I did want to give our audience a chance also to ask some questions and thank you. They're rapidly now flowing in. Um, the, the one that I want to start with is on the national education policy. I think we've mentioned it in passing many times. Um, but the question from an anonymous attendee, <laughs> how has the NEP 2020 changed your work and work ethic? And how has the perception of inclusive schools changed post the rollout of the NEP? And I know, Nilakshi, I think you wanted to touch a little bit more on the NEP and um, the recommendations you have for that. So maybe I'll start with you. Uh, just to make a very short uh, kind of a assessment of the NEP, my personal one is that, yeah, it is written down. That's uh, the best thing. It is spelled out. It is a financial commitment, which is written down. And once you make a financial commitment, you, you have taken ownership of, of something as, uh, you know, as something that needs change. 
um, the fact that you know they have made uh, class three to eight as foundational uh, learning, years three to eight as foundational uh, years very very important. They've taken uh, th those years as uh, foundational years, which they did not uh, you know include earlier. Uh, the emphasis on girls, on transgenders, and on dropouts is very very encouraging. Also, the commitment towards providing bicycles for uh, girl children. Very, very encouraging. All these are very encouraging, but you know there are many buts. Of course, there are many minuses. The fact that gender is not girls and transgender. Okay, gender is an on all-inclusive intersectional experience. It includes those living with the disabilities as well. So it is a much more complicated and nuanced thing. So just by saying girls and transgenders is not like duty over. You know, it is. It's. It's not even a beginning. I mean, it's it's wrong, basically, because very often a transgender is a fully mature person who has decided to become. Of course, a child can have transgender identities. Probably a more inclusive term uh, is needed in this. You know that the, the fact that you know that you could have probably a term like uh, a child with a different sexual orientation, or it could uh, there could be you know other appropriate terminologies for, for this. So uh, gender ped pedagogy in uh, teacher training institutes is very, very important. That is where it all you know, begins. Um, of course, even other than that, in all colleges, in all standard colleges, because many of the people working in a school uh, land up there without the, uh, you know, without, without the pedagogical assistance of the teacher training institute. Uh, then again, gender training in medical and nursing fraternity, important in the police and the military, important, which are already, of course, trying to incorporate these. And all this should be done by asking people from the community, not by a bunch of experts who are to set themselves and have no idea of you know, what it is to, to be a person with a different uh, gender orientation or a sexual identity, sexual orientation. Money is of course needed to end discrimination, and, and a lot of money is being promised in, in the in the document. But money is also needed for other things, for a holistic development, for sports, for mental health, you know, for art and music and all of this together. So that is again something that has to be definitely spelled out by the government when it's making a financial commitment for for uh, the new uh, education policy. Then another thing that they need to definitely look at is the safety of the child, the safety in the public spaces in the school, as well as the private spaces in the school, like a, a small classroom or the toilet, et cetera. Even public, even safety on the digital space must be included. Very, very important part of the child's, uh, you know, uh, child's uh, whereabouts today is uh, digital and online for a lot of time. So these are certain things which definitely need uh, work and, and they, they are, some, most of them, many of them are actually absent. Uh, for that, there should be a kind of a recognition and a removal of tags and labels also for all of this to be really in place. Like, you know, there is this National Register of uh, Transgender Children. You're already labeling them as, as something. You give the child the uh, space to decide whether he, he wants to be known as a woman or a man, okay, or as uh, they, them. Okay, so probably gender non-conforming is a better uh, terminology. Okay, especially in schools where the child is still not sure what he wants to be or she wants to be. Okay, where the, the, the identity of the child is still in process, especially the gender identity of the child is still in process that the child is undergoing a journey. So probably that is a that is a better terminology. And because it is a better terminology, gender non-conforming will compel you to look at all kinds of possibilities. So, you know, bracketing a child or labeling a child this way or that becomes difficult. You are not to do that. Uh, so I would also suggest that, you know, the government take very serious note of all the recommendations that the community has been making. Community, which includes uh, women and feminist groups and other groups uh, like Sathi, Vikalp, Orinam, Tarshi, Vidhi, etc., who have all joined together and made such recommendations. So yeah, so these are the things that I, I would definitely you know want uh, to happen. Thanks, thanks, Nilakshmi. So I think that was a great summary of what's really working well with the NEP, but also what are the areas that need improvement. Um, any other panelists want to come in on how the NEP has actually changed your work or the perception of inclusion for the work that you're doing? Okay. 
Sure. Um, so we did, you know, while we all talk a lot about the NEP now, and uh, we so we did an ana analysis of the old NEP versus the new NEP to just see what's really the change from an inclusion perspective. And I think 95% of the terminology was exactly the same. So while, um, and I think this is something that Nilakshu also spoke about, a document is a document. Uh, it's how you implement it. I think what's exciting for us is that the implementation is now more collaborative. Uh, there is a lot more involvement of many NGOs in this implementation. Uh, there are solutions that we need to take the, to the government. The government doesn't have solutions. They're not experts in the sector. They're not experts in the field. It's people like us who need to make sure that the NEP becomes implementable. Otherwise, it just rem remains all these beautiful words on a document, which we've been speaking for years together. There's really nothing different that we are talking about. We always spoke about differences. We always spoke as a country. In fact, we did always speak about differences. We spoke about, but it, nothing's uh, nothing's going to change till we don't figure out uh, scalable solutions, implementable solutions, and of course, the whole shift in attitudes. Even now, when we work with various governments, the ID department, which is the inclusive education department, and the and the state departments, which is the mainstream again, the mainstream state departments, mainstream education departments function totally parallel. They're not talking to each other even within a department. So how do you really make inclusion possible? We have, we have spoken about interstate. So the the whole Samagra, which has come together now, which looks at interministry conversions, where is the question of interministry conversions when we're not doing interdepartmental conversions? So we have a tough time having getting a voice out there because the voice is not a mainstream voice. So if you're speaking for the minority, you will be you will be in that space where you're talking for the minorities and not the other um, and not all children. So that integrate again, it's all attitudinal really, and and a lot of that needs to change at a systemic level. That people who are making decisions, there are more, many people with so many barriers that when we speak to so many government officials, there is so much barrier in in every time that we try and promote inclusion. They're like, okay, please talk to the ID department about it. Don't talk to us about it. So there is a huge um, attitudinal shift that needs to happen within bureaucracy. So while the NEP is gone in, um, you know, and the guidelines are getting formed for that, what is it that we're doing to change those attitudes within the bureaucrats who are actually going to implement it? Is there something that we can do to make them more aware um, and, and uh, almost like an entire rejig of what you feel education should be? Yeah, thanks. So Nali, I think the shift from not just the focus on the document, but the implementation and the consultative process to really listen and source ideas right, from organizations like yourself and others on the field to support that process seems really important. Um, another question here, I think we talked a lot about different forms of identities, but not as much around intersectionality. There's a question around how can minority student-focused schools come to terms with intersectionality? Do you have experience of working with such schools and educators in the past? Maybe I'll pass this one to Bertha to kick us off. What would you mean by intersectionality? Yeah. Um, yeah, what would you mean by intersectionality? <laughs> I'm trying to pronounce it. Yeah, so maybe I can uh, repeat the question. Um, so a school, let's say, like Jyoti Srirat, that's focused on visually impaired uh, students, uh, have also expanded to be inclusive of all students of all disabilities and learning needs, and it, it, at the end of the day, anyone, right? Um, how does the school come to terms with intersectionality in terms of different identities coming together? And how have maybe you supported um, minority students with multiple kind of intersectional uh, um, Please, needs. I see. Uh, Dion, I have Kamo with me, our director. Can he answer in my place, please? Yes, of course. <laughs> that was a silent noise giving you tips, huh, Bertha? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> hi, hi, uh, I'm, I, I'm Kamo Narona and um, um, I just want to share, I mean, speak to the panelists and say that, you know, how inspiring it has been listening to all of you. And um, the moderation has been excellent. So I, I needed a few tips. And um, as you can see, Bertha is an expert at passing the buck, 
you know, especially <laughs> she, she's really good at that. The, <laughs> the actually when it, uh, you, you had asked about the NEP, et cetera, and so on. I, I do believe by, of course, again, it's, it's, it's kind of cliched, but the, the term SEDGs, May, you know, brings it beyond persons with disability. And I think at the moment, whether it comes to NEP or whether it comes to inclusive education, to change the mindset of the system and bureaucrats that inclusive education is not mainstream education uh, added with a tale of children with disabilities. So, and I think, and, and, and that is why I think when, when, when we look at, uh, you know, uh, the uh, socially, economically disadvantaged groups. How do you bring this mindset into the system is, is, is to me, a, a major challenge. And, and I think earlier on, I was listening to one of the panelists, is that our whole system, I mean, and that's not only in India, across the world, the moment you look at competition, then you look at segregation. You know, competition leads to segregation and competition leads, and, and, and I think somebody had mentioned about IITs where there are lakhs of people and then you funnel them to 15, 20,000. That leads to, and we were trying, especially within the school system in Jyoti Shroth, can we, can we talk of excellence? Can we remove the term competition from our mindsets, from the mindsets of parents? It's very, very hard. But can we look at excellence and collaboration? Because if you look at 21st century skills and social emotional learning and so on, what's going to take us forward is excellence and collaboration. And, and there is, and, and the sky is the limit for that. But um, how do you break a system which is so discriminatory and which is totally against all democratic values where you start comparing one child with another child, you know, and, and, and how do you look at, at evaluation systems? So when you, when you look at intersectionality and, and within our own system, et cetera, and we have a long way to go. We are looking, one is we want to ask our children happy Coming into the school, is there some way of, 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 of kind of indicating that and, and measuring that? And are children happy leaving the school? Both. That means they are happy going back. But like, it's not that they are, uh, you know, really sad coming into school. So that is, that is one. And the other is, how do we ensure a system where there is valued presence and valued presence is that there is you, uh, ensuring that there is communication. You know, so for example, one of the things that, that, and it's happened naturally, we have about 300 or 280 students and almost all of them are communicating in sign, including children who are visually impaired because they want to communicate. So, you know, how do you bring in this whole culture that communication is very, very important and that your presence is valued, you know? What you, what you, uh, what you perform is valued, you know? You, you valued presence, valued performance, and, 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 and finally, you're valued for the contribution that you can make. And across intersectionality, and I think this is another great challenge, is how do you get parents, the system, the teachers, to say that every child has a strength that can be leveraged and they are not a challenge to be overcome. And I think that is the key, that if, if there is a, and, and, and how do you move away from labels and, 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 and look at learners? These to me are major challenges that we need to look at in the next four, four or five years. I don't know whether it makes sense that when a child comes in and, and to get it into our own head sometimes as professionals, that we start looking at, you know, at, at LGBT, autism, this, rather than looking at the child who has strengths that can be leveraged, you know? 
what is the what is the child ready you know is the what are the child's interests what is the the preference and not profile you know learning learning preference and can we train teachers to actually i believe that if if the whole teacher training is just focused on this and nothing else you can change the system so there has to be a revolution in teacher training we cannot go back to old systems and talk about nep nep will not work with teachers without teacher for quality education you need quality teachers and i think it's very simple i mean for for me it's very very simple when a child goes when a teacher goes into a class or into a session can the can the teacher say in 15 minutes this is what my child will know and will be able to do you know how can we train teachers for getting children to understand and getting children to transfer that into real life sorry i'm i've i've talked too much i don't know whether that makes sense no, i think that was so powerful um thank you for coming in and yeah. sharing your perspectives i think just the uh difference from moving the importance of moving from uh profile to preference learner preference not yeah. labeling children by the challenges they have but yeah. by the strength that they possess to show yeah. how valued they are yeah. um in in the contributions that they're making really really resonate so mm -hmm. so thanks for coming in yeah. so nali i saw you unmute yourself so i think that inspired also i just thought. kind of i think as soon as kamo came in i just realized that this has been such a heavy women uh, panel i have been trapped that gender i think yeah. kamo coming in is just kind of made that shift so that Dara, is, thanks for passing that on to him sara <laughs> has company finally <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely i i'll just speak a little bit on intersectionality because that this is the work that we are doing and this is what we believe is the tomorrow in terms of inclusion uh, and this is where we we feel again as professionals all of us need to shift to because all of us as professionals have been bracketed into counselors special educators a special educator working with autism a special educator working with xyz so the inter intersectionality of understanding um, what the child's again i'm going to go back to the risks because that's critical if if there is a child with um with a learning disability what is it that what are the other risks that the child is facing um is it uh, what are its conditions at home uh, what are the conditions um in in school that are not enabling for the child so understanding the child as a whole and what is the mental health state of the child uh, when the child is functioning in school so there is a solution that we're developing right now and it also links to what nilaksh also spoke about earlier in terms of the documents that are present in many schools in terms of for teachers to know what to do so this is an app that we are developing currently which looks at components where we look at screening holistically and say here are the possible risks that the child has here are the possible demographic risks family risks risk for abuse risk for so just look at the child as a whole and really examine what are we dealing with when we are talking about why is this child struggling in that classroom and then for the teachers then to link linked trainings which is completely on the mobile on how to manage these risks how to manage somebody with uh, with autism in their classroom how do you, how what is it how to include these children in that classroom uh, how what are what are some of the basic things that i can do as a teacher what are the things that i need to get professionals involved in how do i manage the, how do i talk to the parents how do i uh, educate the parents about it so all these i uh, what happens when if a child is coming uh, said that the child has been abused what can be what can i do as a teacher how do i deal with it so we are actually putting up all these modules on the app which is easy access to the teachers because when we do teacher training it's a one time effort however the teacher when the teacher comes across a particular child doesn't have that linkage or forgets what they have done at that point of time so ready access information to say hey here's the issue here's how you can manage it or here's how you can include this particular child in your classroom so that's something that's under development and it's been piloted in the state of tamil nadu right now with about 1600 teachers and we're kind of taking that forward um, even linking experts remotely to uh, to areas where experts are not available what do you do if a child uh, in a in a rural area in a tribal area has these challenges where is the expert going to come from so looking at how telemedicine something like telemedicine can be integrated and access can be given to the children in the remotest areas where they need it the most 
So that's something that we are building a solution now around. And intersectionality is so critical because we actually had a room full of experts not knowing each other's expertise. So where is the question of a teacher knowing everything else? Uh, so I, I think that's, I mean, I'm so glad that came up. Uh, I think that's an important way to look at inclusion um, and, and the way forward to look at inclusion. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nalakshi. And I think that partly also answers uh, Sharmila's question, which was around, are there some good criteria or tools to rate, let's say, content or educational institutions on how inclus inclusive they are? So the tools that you have to actually screen for different risks of students and the modules to support teachers to identify uh, these differing needs and take an intersectionality lens would be all really valuable. We're almost out of time, believe it or not, our two hours is almost over. And uh, I, we got a message from the founder of Belong, Neerat, uh, who had an urgent, perhaps final question. And given that he's helped provide this space for all of us, I did want to give him that final privilege to ask, ask his question. So Neerat, if you're able to actually just come directly on microphone and ask your burning question to our panelists, um, please come forward. Thanks very much, Diane. Uh, th thanks, everyone. It's just been, I've been listening, and it's just been so wonderful to uh, get all these ideas. And I've jotted down a bunch of, uh, sort of takeaways for, for myself personally. Uh, very quickly, my question is uh, to make some of this change happen, uh, we'll need resources, right? Uh, what's your view on the upstream sort of funding situation for inclusion in schools? So let's say the way uh, funding gets thought about uh, in the government, in philanthropy, uh, in the development space. Uh, have you seen uh, progress in terms of how, let's say, budgets might have been set aside for this uh, this kind of activity uh, in any of these spaces, and, and are there some global examples of how you've seen this budgeting play out uh, uh, fairly effectively in maybe some other countries? So now you're on mute if you're saying something. Yeah, I I, I mean I I really uh, this is the pain point I think for all of us. Uh, uh, unfortunately, none. Most of the mainstream funders, most of the funders of, of uh, fund mainstream education, inclusion, even uh, organizations who are funding inclusion only fund uh, fund typical models of segregated models. When nobody is investing in systemic integration, no one is investing uh, investing in how the government, how at scale can we take inclusion. Uh, I think that's that's a huge missing piece. And why, why do you think that's okay? Is it because the problem is not recognized? Is it the problem is very controversial? Is it uh, not high up in the queue? What's what's going on? Yeah, it's not high up in the queue. It's uh, we're still looking at marginalized as a very small population, whereas the large population of India is marginalized. It's also the way we've been, like I said, these are two segregated sectors. They all they both need to come together. For us to say this is this is one problem these are not two different problems we're dealing with inclusion has to be a part of your mainstream solution so when you fund for mainstream solutions is inclusion a part and i know many funders who give those forms saying are you inclusive tick 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 but it makes no sense because you're not really investing in the inclusion space and have you seen any global examples of how budgeting for this kind of stuff actually works very effectively uh, are there any global best practices you've seen yeah, so in developed countries, so we've been speaking to many developed countries on the practices that they've been doing and the number of resourcing that is there for inclusion is almost equal into the mainstream solutions and it is considered to be a part of the mainstream. It's not a separate a budget that you're talking about. This is a part of your mainstream solution and therefore all the people involved, all the solutions involved are invested in together. So we spoke to somebody in Finland, we spoke to somebody uh, in, in the US, in UK, and many of them had the same perspective that our budgets are not different. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Yeah. Anyone else who has like a very quick point just, uh, before I pass back to my notes? Uh, yeah, Nira, if I can add, because you know, throughout this panel, I've been this like big sweeping changes. I don't want to like, I don't want to offer something which is a big sweeping change. And uh, the model, global model, I, I look up to is Finland. And now we can obviously talk about the size and difference in size and demography and all of that. But the philosophy of education in Finland, which actually took it from a poor country to a rich country, is this idea that the local, the neighborhood school is the best school. Right? That's the idea of education in Finland, that you, you, know, you don't have to choose this private school. You don't have to, you know, choose where you live because of the school. The neighborhood school is the best school. And this happens because they look at education as a civil right. It's seen as a public service, it's funded by, by the welfare state. And we need to stop looking at education as a commodity. For me, that is the difference. 
if you look at education as a, it is a fundamental right in India, but it is still highly commoditized. If you can change that mindset, if education is seen as a civil right, as a public service that the government must give high quality education for every child and the neighborhood school is the best school, obviously again, the cities must not be gentrified for this to work. But if you are able to do that, that's the kind of funding you need. That's the kind of mindset you need for us to be able to really reimagine education, really do it differently. And that's how it translates, right? Even in COVID, Finland closed schools for 20 days. We are at 400 days with no visibility for when we'll open. And that was what the education minister said. The schools will close last and they will open first because there's a recognition that the education of children must be the biggest priority of the government of any country. So that is the change for me in terms of funding, in terms of resources, budget allocation. Is education truly the fundamental right of every child and how much money are we willing to put into that? Thanks. Yeah, but can I can I just um, make a quick point, just following up on what Suchita said, that when you look at the, the 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 Finland model, and although it's a small population, but it can be like since since it's 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 a kind of a, you know state subject, a state could be as big as Finland could be done. But if you look at the Finnish model, in the Finnish model. In the pre-primary and primary, they have almost 20% of their students as students with special needs. So, and when it comes to higher secondary and secondary level, it comes down to about four to 5%. Because what they have done is that in the early education, right from zero to nine, they have already identified special needs and put in their resources there. Whereas if you look at our module, we are trying to put in our resources later on and, and, and it will never work there, okay? And of course, as, as Suchitra said, that, that there is no private uh, institutions in, in, um, in, 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 uh, in, in Finland. The government supports everything and the most sought out profession is that of a teacher. You know, that, so that is, that is very, very important. And the community, and the school is decentralized to that level where the system trusts the school where the teachers are so well empowered and parents are empowered that they trust that they will make the best decision. And that is the point of the neighborhood school for their children. And I think that, and that's where funding is very, very important. This problem in India is that you have parallel for example, you have the Ministry of Social Justice looking at disability and the Ministry of Education looking at education. They say that they are talking together, but all of us know that it never happens. So I believe that teachers, the certification of teachers should be under one certifying authority, not RCI and teacher education. And, and um, to me, money has to go into teacher education, which is revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmel. Last, last word, yeah. Sure, money, very last yeah. word in 30 seconds. <laughs> till, till, till people like Neera don't stop asking, where is the money going to come from? Mm. Nothing is going to change. Why should we ask where the money should come from? Mm -hmm. It should come from the state, right? It's the mm -hmm. primary responsibility of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we should not, you know, that's the thing. That's like a dream, I think, of all of us. So maybe one day, maybe someday. But till that time, it's, I think, the NGOs and the private uh, parties which are running the show. They will continue to run the show. I think they will not stop their commitment. But we definitely need the state to fund. Step up, yeah. Step up, be more inclusive. No meaning to the new education policy other than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thanks, everyone. We're just a few minutes over time. So I'm going to unfortunately have to cut off this really fascinating and insightful discussion. Uh, but for the audience, there are many more sessions. This is just the opening. So stay tuned. I think we're logging back at 2 p.m. for another panel on diverse needs uh, and diverse practices. Um, but yeah, just wanted to recap. Thank you so much to our panelists for really taking us through such a fun and a useful journey right from the framework of uh, who, where, what, and how of inclusive schools to really diving in to understand the importance of attitudes, culture, and mindsets 
uh, to really unpacking how COVID has thrown everything up in the air and exacerbated some of these entrenched inequalities and are leaving kids behind and how we need to really build back, not just better, but differently. And I hope a lot of the rich advice and recommendations and suggestions and experiences our panelists shared today uh, are a starting point for that, for rethinking, reimagining completely. Why can't we be like a Finland and really just make sure that every single child is included and that is just a given right, rather than thinking about, you know, where's the money coming from? Um, I think it's a revolutionary thought, but at the same time, perhaps, uh, perhaps not so much, perhaps that is the way that it should have been always. Um, and we hope that as the um, education systems now wake up uh, at the wake of COVID, there's a new opportunity to, to reimagine and rethink and some of these uh, solutions that our panelists suggested can get incorporated. So thank you so much for uh, such a rich opening session and hope um, to continue the conversation in the next uh, day and a half. Thanks everyone. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, and before you leave, also, I want to say that in case if you wish to connect with the audiences who are, who are present here, uh, you know, some of them might be from organizations that you wish to partner with. So if you wish to drop in your mails or contact information, you can do so. Uh, it's not compulsory, of course. Um, so thank you. And we'll meet again, uh, you know, with the audiences uh, at 2. Uh, our next next panel is diverse needs and diverse practices. So looking forward. Thank you, Dawn, for moderating this. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. And thank you, everyone, for attending.